Greetings students, Mr. Little here. And today we're gonna to talk about political shifts in East Asia. This is chapter 26, part one. By the end of this video, you should be able to answer these essential questions. How did East Asian states change as a result of the end of the Mongol empire? And how did the process of state building in East Asia, uh, how was that process influenced by economic and social concerns? So let us start with the new Ming dynasty that succeeds the Mongol Yuan dynasty in 1368. Um, the Mongol dynasty, while we, we tend to think of it as, as highly efficient and well-functioning, uh, was actually, uh, had fallen on pretty hard times within 100 years of the death of Genghis Khan. And in the end, uh, a combination of poor financial management, um, discontent amongst the peasants, and, a con and flood and famine, partially as a result of the climate anomaly known as Little Ice Age, uh, led to uh, the Red Turban Revolt and what is also known as the White Lotus Movement uh, to remove the Mongols from the Yuan Dynasty. And it would be replaced uh, by the Ming Dynasty led by a one Emperor Hong, Hong Wu, who uh, renamed the area era the era Ming, which meant glorious. And he became emperor and almost immediately one of his most notable feats was setting about rebuilding the Great Wall of China. And uh, laying the foundation for the Forbidden City. Uh, he was succeeded by his son, the Emperor Yongle, who set the tone for this cultural renewal that his father had so envisioned. Um, he recentered Confucian values and the civil service exam, brought it back full force. Um, he dispatched Zheng He's famous expeditions across uh, India and East Africa. He also uh, continued uh, his predecessor's efforts to build a new capital, the Forbidden City, uh, which was completed later in his life. He also commissioned something called the Yongle Encyclopedia, uh, which was a chronicle of all of Chinese history. Uh, only about a third of it survives today, if I'm remembering the story correctly. But nonetheless, the Ming Dynasty can really be characterized, among other things, as just being a, an attempt to really reinvigorate uh, traditional Chinese cultural values. Um, and the Ming Dynasty did continue to wage war against the steppe nomads. Part of the reason that Zheng He's famous voyages uh, were canceled was because the uh, Ming Dynasty had to pay to defend the northern frontier where the Mongols could still be a threat. And the Mongols, in fact, even captured a Ming emperor a little bit later in the dynasty who attempted to go do battle with them. So cultural renewal, but still got to watch for those nomads. The Ming Dynasty is later succeeded by the Qing Dynasty, which will be the last imperial dynasty in Chinese history, if you don't count uh, some of the other minor pretenders to the throne that come afterwards. Um, but the Qing are, are, are interesting because like the Mongols, they're also not native Chinese. They're not Han Chinese. Um, they are uh, from a region that in English we call Manchuria. It's a region just north of Korea. Interestingly enough, Manchuria uh, is not a province in China. Um, that area is actually three different provinces in Manchuria. But the Qing spoke a different language than Chinese, um, and they were more closely related to Koreans than they were to uh, Chinese, linguistically speaking. Uh, the Qing moved in and they conquered the ailing Ming Dynasty. And an interesting twist, uh, in addition, the way the Ming Dynasty had overthrown the Yuan Dynasty during a time of flood and famine, uh, the Qing Dynasty overthrew the Ming Dynasty during a time of flood and famine, almost as though the Mandate of Heaven had been lost again. Um, now, the Qing had to play a balancing act once they took the throne and established an empire. Uh, historians debate if they even, even intended to build an empire in the first place, but nonetheless, they did. And so they had to uh, keep their nomadic identity while still claiming the mandate of heaven, uh, much in the way the Mongols had. Uh, the Qing played it a little better. They outlasted the Mongols by quite a, quite a few years. Uh, so, for example, they embraced the civil service exam, but they did reserve uh, some high-ranking appointments for Manchu officials. Uh, Manchus also had special extra legal privileges that regular Chinese citizens did not have. Um, in, in particular, they forced regular non-Manchu Chinese people to wear what's called the QU, which was a long braid of hair, as a sign of submission to the Manchu rulers. But that said, uh, the Qing did, uh, you know, give Chinese a place in their society, uh, especially in the military. The Qing military apparatus had a whole special section for uh, native Han Chinese, and they made use of Han Chinese technology, uh, especially when they conquered all the other nomadic lands by the mid-1700s under the emperor Qianlong. Um, there's also worth noting uh, one of the College Board required examples is the famous emperor portraits. That is, they had themselves painted in these large portraits wearing golden robes with dragons on the throne to really emphasize that I am the emperor. Now, maybe I speak a different language uh, than you do, um, but I'm still the emperor. I have the mandate of heaven, and so you better obey me. 
It's also worth noting that the Qing dynasty, uh, in securing the borderlands, the traditional nomadic bases that have been causing so much trouble to China, uh, really solidified uh, the modern day boundaries of China, um, including some places that aren't in contemporary China, like Mongolia and some parts of um, what's now Russia. Nonetheless, um, the, the Qing dynasty really sets the geographic tone for contemporary China. So a little bit further east uh, in Korea, there's also a bit of a political change. Uh, that is the shift from the Goryeo dynasty, which is deposed in 1392, to the Chosen dynasty, um, which came in part because of the end of the Mongols in China also meant a loss of support for the rulers in Korea who would kind of hitch their wagon to the Mongols. Um, it didn't help that the Mongol invasion, uh, attempted invasions of Japan had failed miserably, costing the lives of many Korean sailors who had whose boats they had used to ferry the Mongol army to the shores of Japan. Um, this had made the Joseon, the, the, the Goryeo rulers very unpopular, and so they lost their support and were quickly deposed. Uh, the new rulers of the Chosen dynasty in, in many ways reflected uh, the Chinese shift uh, in, in, in that was going on in the Ming right there. Uh, there was a loss of, of influence over Buddhism, uh, and Neo-Confucian values were um, elevated. Uh, not that they had ever been, um, <clears throat> they had been, they had, they had had a presence in the Goryeo dynasty, but Buddhism had really been the primary uh, religion during the Goryeo dynasty. That said, it's known that Joseon rulers still patronized Buddhist sculptures. It's known that there were Buddhas in the royal palace during the Joseon dynasty. So it wasn't like Buddhism was completely removed and Neo-Confucian values completely took over. But nonetheless, Neo-Confucianism did become the primary um, ideology of the Joseon dynasty, which would rule Korea right up until 1890 when it was annexed by Japan. But the Joseon dynasty had a lot to deal with. Um, they were invaded by uh, the Japanese in 1590 in a two-year war that was incredibly destructive to the to their country. And later on, the newly established Qing dynasty um, would before sorry before the Qing established their dynasty in China uh, would launch uh, some small-scale invasions from their homeland in Manchuria against the the Korean kings. And so these two sort of really devastating uh, historical episodes coming on each other's heels uh, really drove the Joseon to adopt a policy of very strict isolation, much in the same way that the Japanese would and the Chinese would. Um, they, they really closed off their country to the outside. They even drove off two expeditions, one by the French and one by the Americans in the late 1800s to try to kind of open up uh, the hermit kingdom as it would become known. Uh, so there was that. In a little bit further south, if we go down to Vietnam, uh, the Ming Dynasty had attempted to reassert its control over um, what it, what in Chinese history was called like the southern provinces or the rebellious provinces, what we now know as like North Vietnam. Um, but even though there was a 20-year occupation, uh, the Vietnamese refused to accept this. And eventually, through civil war and some help from pirates, uh, the Vietnamese managed to drive out the Ming Chinese. Uh, and the newly independent Lia dynasty um, is expanded the borders of what is now contemporary Vietnam all the way down to the um, now down to what we consider Vietnam. If you look at Vietnam on a map, it's like sort of a, a thin strip that runs along the coast. The Lia dynasty expanded south and drove off the Khmer kingdoms, pushing them into Cambodia. Um, it, also during this time in Vietnam, very similar to in Korea, Confucian values take center stage. Uh, despite the fact that they actually spent their, their, their early history driving off the Chinese, Confucian values nonetheless, nonetheless left their mark. And uh, Vietnam was uh, arguably a Confucian state, the only one in Southeast Asia. Vietnam also, interestingly enough, unlike the other states in Southeast Asia, adopted um, heavy amounts of rice farming from the Chinese, uh, whereas the other states in Southeast Asia didn't do that. Um, Vietnam did adopt uh, rice farming techniques and Confucian values. So Vietnam, even though its history is shaped by resisting the Chinese, its history is also shaped by adapting uh, some Chinese uh, tactics and values. Um, and just like um, just like in Korea, uh, the government, even though it didn't, couldn't officially remove Buddhism, uh, did its best to sort of remove the influence of Buddhism. Uh, one king even going so far as to ban the construction of any new Buddhist temples anywhere in the country at all.
This is actually an interesting picture here. This is a turtle ship, which is a very particular type of ship that existed in the Korean Navy that was used to defeat the Japanese invasion force. Um, a turtle ship is, is like you'd imagine. It's a very big ship with a very hard shell, which made it very difficult to, to damage or destroy. Um, there is a famous uh, movie about a very famous battle uh, where an a, a Korean admiral named Admiral Yi manages to defeat a force almost, I believe it's 12 versus 500. I could have that number wrong, but it's 12 versus like a multiple of 100. And it, the turtle ships played a small part in that battle, but they managed to help uh, defeat the Japanese Navy and make sure that the invasion of the Korean Peninsula did not go smoothly. Speaking of Japan, uh, we have the establishment of what is known as the shogunate. That is a, uh, a military dictatorship that sort of ends the warring period, the Sengoku period, which began uh, with the fall of the Ashikura shogunate, which began after the end of the uh, imperial rule of the Heian period. Um, so the people often ask, like, well, who had more power, the shogun or the emperor? Well, the emperor remained a symbol, but the shogun had the real power. And so the emperor got to stay at his palace in Kyoto, but the emperor in Edo, which is what we now call Tokyo, uh, actually had the real power. And so the shogun's palace was the real palace that you wanted to go to. And so the shogun, who was simply the most powerful daimyo uh, and had the most samurai as well as the most uh, strongly equipped samurai, uh, gradually asserted his control over Japan. It was a very similar situation to what you saw in medieval Europe, where you had uh, feudal powers uh, fighting one another. Um, so the, the Tokugawa, the Tokugawa Ieyasu, who was the first one to unify all of Japan, um, brought all the daimyo together and all the samurai together and said, let's invade Korea. Uh, the idea being that they could um, conquer Korea and then as a stepping stone, they could go conquer China. Now it didn't work out that way. Uh, the Korean War, um, this, this particular Korean War ended up being uh, such a bloody stalemate that the successors of Tokugawa Ieyasu decided that it wasn't worth it and they, they pulled back and went home. Um, they had other things to worry about. Uh, the Spanish and the Portuguese had arrived, uh, bringing with them uh, new tools and uh, a new religion known as Christianity, um, which the Shogun was very concerned about, in part because uh, the Japanese people adopted it so readily. Um, and some even launched a revolt known as the Shima, Shima Bara Rebellion, um, that was a a Christian-led revolt against local lords in the south of Japan. And so this combined with a concern that the Spanish were going to take over Japan from their, their colony in the Philippines uh, led to uh, the, the shogun officially closing Japan in 1639. Now there's a lot of debate about how closed you could actually close a country. Um, for example, they continued to trade with the Dutch in Nagasaki, as well as Chinese merchants um, could could make their way and meet Japanese merchants in the Philippines. So you know, how do you actually close a country? But nonetheless, uh, to outside influence, uh, Japan was highly restricted after 1639, highly restricted. And so here is a kind of a, a nice pyramid about how um, society was structured in the Tokugawa shogunate, where the emperor may be at the top, but he does not have any actual power, whereas the shogun and his, um, his lords and his warriors actually have all the power. Anyways, uh, you should be able to answer those two essential questions from the beginning of the video. I want to thank you for joining me. This is Mr. Little, and I will see you next time.